How you doing, everybody? Today we're going to take a quick look at Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, directed by James Mangold and starring Harrison Ford, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and Mads Mikkelsen. In 1969, we find Dr. Jones living in New York City and about to retire from teaching. And things are not going so well for Indy. He and Marion have split and are in the process of divorcing. And Mutt has been poochied. And good riddance. But then one day, Indy runs into his goddaughter Helena, played by Waller-Bridge, who is looking for an artifact her father once had, Archimedes' dial. Indy has half of the dial, but the other half is hidden somewhere out there in the world. And so the two are off on a grand adventure to recover the second half of the dial, while being tailed by a Nazi scientist. Oh yes, even in 1969, the Nazis are still around. They're like cockroaches. They're disgusting and hard to kill. So way back in 1979, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg made a deal with Paramount to make five Indiana Jones movies. It sure took them long enough, but we finally got to movie number five. Funny thing is, back in 2008, Harrison Ford said he would return for a fifth movie, but only if it did not take 20 years to develop. Fortunately, it only took 15. And this is the first Indiana Jones movie with no real involvement from Lucas or Spielberg, although they are both still executive producers. And yet, it still more or less feels like an Indiana Jones movie. It's not as good as the original trilogy, but I do think it's a step up from Crystal Skull. And I figured there were basically two directions they could go here. They could either go back to the mystical Christian artifacts, or they could do something new. And when you've already done Aliens, I think the only new thing you can do is time travel. Oddly enough, they kinda did both, although the former was a red herring. Initially, we see Indy going after the Lance of Longinus, but that turns out to be a dead end, and instead the MacGuffin is Archimedes' dial. And it's actually based on a real artifact called the Antikythera. It was used by the ancient Greeks to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance. Because, I don't know what was in the water back then, but those guys were goddamn geniuses. The action sequences are pretty well done and a lot of fun to watch. Uh, none of them feel particularly unrealistic given Indy's age. They made that work pretty well. And thankfully, they did not quite do anything as ridiculous as The Fridge. The movie's opening sequence where they flashed back to a younger Indiana Jones with a de-aged Harrison Ford looked pretty damn good. I would not at all be surprised if that's where the majority of this movie's budget went, because I don't know how else this thing could have cost $300 million. I think most people guessed that this movie would involve time travel, and they were right, and I really did not have a problem with that. I mean, if I can suspend my disbelief for a fully functional voodoo doll, I can buy time travel. That's not a problem. That said, I don't think the story will hold up as well as the original trilogy. There's not much here that's particularly memorable. Except maybe for the movie's climax, which, again, probably accounts for a good chunk of the budget. I suspect some fans may be divided over that sequence, but I thought it was perfectly fine. Indy has now reached the too-old-for-this-shit phase of his life, and he is not handling it well. He is an idealist in a world that left idealism behind long ago. Mud is gone, Marion is still alive, but no longer around, and he's seen better days. And Ford plays this version of the character pretty well. He's bitter and sad, but still trying to keep going, or at least trying to find a reason to. I really liked Waller Bridge as Helena in the playful, devilish attitude that she brought to the table. And she is kind of an anti-Indy in a way. She's an archaeologist and adventurer like Indy, but she is in it for very different reasons. Indy has a great respect for historical artifacts. Helena has a great respect for the amount of money she can make off of those artifacts. Indy's like, that belongs in a museum, and she's like, nah, it belongs in an auction. Mama's gotta make rent. She's not without heart. There's a good person in there somewhere, but you gotta dig through a few layers of greed to get to it. This is not the first time Mickelson has played a villain, and unsurprisingly, he is still really good at it. That man is an intimidating presence. He's hoping he can use the dial to correct some mistakes from the past, which went in a different direction than I expected, but actually kind of made sense. And it was nice to see John Reese davies and Karen Allen one last time. I'm a little disappointed that they could not find a spot for Kihi Kwan. There's a sequence where Indy gets some help from an old friend played by Antonio Banderas, and I think Kihi Kwan could have filled that same role. It would have worked. No disrespect to Banderas, mind you. He was fine. I'm honestly a little surprised that this movie appears to be bombing, although at the time of this recording, it's made about $250 million. Even in this day and age, for over 90% of movies out there, that would be a huge success. Unfortunately, this was expensive as hell. As fun as that opening sequence was, maybe they should have saved some money and cut it. But anyway, I liked it. It's not great, but it's totally fine. And if you're a fan of this franchise, I think it's worth a matinee. And that's all I have to say about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Till next time.
Take care.